Hello, I'm Catherine O'Brien. Today I'm going to give a summary of the development of the doctrines of the incarnation of Jesus in the patristic era, up to and including the Council of Chalcedon in 451 AD. Jesus, son of Mary, lived in Naz Nazareth. Multiple historical records affirm this. The Jewish leaders insisted that the Romans put him to death because he claimed to be God, which was blasphemy. With the resurrection and many healings, Jesus exercised superhuman powers. Consequently, his followers were left with many questions. As then Professor Ratzinger and now Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI states in his introduction to Christianity, historical reflection is needed because truth is revealed, or is revealed over time. In this short talk, because there are patristic scholars, this all could be dealt with in greater depth. I'll just be giving a summary. Um, I'll be exploring a number of questions related to whether Jesus was human. Did he have a human body? And did he have a real body? And did he have a real human soul? And then we'll get into the questions about whether or not he was divine. Was he God? And lastly, we will look at if he was both human and divine, how would that work? And how were the two united? And, and I will make a note at the beginning here that I do use the word human, not man, as in a collective sense. Um, Jesus was, in fact, a male human, known as a man. But the point of the questions here is whether he became a human being. And so for clarity, I am going to use the word human. Before we get too, start, too far into things, I wanted to take a moment to discuss the development of doctrine, which is what we're talking about, um, and to make some clarifications. Some of the questions that we have to ask when we're looking at developing doctrine or we're exploring what happened historically in this area is, was it needed? And I think you could easily argue in this case that, yes, it was very much needed. We needed to understand who Jesus was. And, and we'll get into that briefly as to why that was so significant in terms of the taking on of humanity by God and taking on the fullness of humanity as well as understanding that Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, was fully God and what, that, what the implications of that are. So yes, very much needed. And, and what does it need to look like is another question that has to be uh, explored. And in matters that are this fundamental to the Christian faith, we're gonna need author authoritative, forceful, clear statements of what is accurate and what is not accurate as, par, as far as revelation goes in this area. And who can contribute is always a question as well. And as we will see, because I did a little uh, digging on all of the different contributors to the conversation that we're going to discuss today, some of them were, as far as we could tell, laymen and others were patriarchs. We have popes weighing in, councils weighing in, bishops weighing in, priests weighing in. And so we have a class that of people who are educated, of men in this case, all men who are educated, and most of whom were in holy orders. So they have some gifts of the Holy Spirit inspiring them. And we have the contributions then that were seriously uh, considered and part of this development were of people with the kind of background that they could substantiate what they had to say in an intelligent way. Whether they were correct or not, they could put forth their positions carefully. Um, this wasn't just some random person saying something and, and because that wouldn't be an appropriate person. And then who decides what is true and what is error? So we'll talk in a minute about the role of the magisterium in this determination, as well as the role of scripture and the role of tradition. Because yeah, it all, we have divine revelation from God, we are mere humans, how does this work? And how does it get protected against error creeping in? And as you will see in the course of today's talk, there were many errors, errors that tried to come into all of this. Um, 
Father Yves Congar, a Dominican theologian whose life spanned virtually the entirety of the 20th century and who was made a cardinal shortly before his death, wrote several works. Um, and I will be citing um, today from some of them. And he wrote about the magisterium saying that it was the authoritative teaching of those commissioned to speak to the community in the name of Christ, clarifying the faith that the com community professes. He reminds us that the church has an inalienable responsibility to pass on revelation and to, and to keep it free from error. And that the magisterium is not a source of revelation, but a witness to revelation handed down to us from God. And directly from Dei Verbum of Vatican II, they, they teach us, the Council Fathers teach us, it is clear, therefore, that in the supremely wise arrangement of God, sacred tradition, sacred scripture, and the magisterium of the church are so connected and associated that one of them cannot stand without the others. So that's why I use this image of the three-legged stool, because these three authorities have to work collaboratively, and they all have to be there. Back to that day, very well. Working together, each in its own way, under the action of the one Holy Spirit, they all contribute effectively to the salvation of souls. So we need to have clarity about this. Um, and I'm sorry, I was just citing from Avery Dulles's, um, a 20th century Jesuit and uh, priest and eventually cardinal in his book, Magisterium. And then um, Yves Congar uh, wrote a book called The Meaning of, Trend of Tradition. And in it, he delineated two aspects of sacred tradition. So two main jobs, so to speak. And one is conservation and safeguarding the purity of the deposit of faith. Okay, so we're, we're maintaining it. And then the other is development and to open the present to the future, to clarify, to rearticulate the truth in light of new situations and cultures. Father Kangar noted, and I quote, Tradition is not merely the mechanical transmission of, the, of a passive deposit. The very concept implies the delivery of an object from the possession of one person to another. Therefore, the transition from one living being to another. It is incorporated into a subject, a living subject. A living subject necessarily puts something of him or herself into what he or she receives." End quote. Um, another author that I would be remiss to, to not mention is uh, Cardinal Newman, who in his essay on the development of Christian doctrine, notes a number of tests for the de genuine development of doctrine. These didn't come into being, and he didn't write until 1500 years or so after the debates that we're going to discuss today. Nonetheless, his tests or notes of development, of genuine development are evident. So I wanna point them out preservation of type, continuity of principles, power of assimilation, logical sequence, anticipation of its future, conservative action upon its past, and chronic vigor staying power. And that last one, you need to look with a long view as you'll hear some of these teachings went on for quite a long time. So the first question, was Jesus human? Did he have a real human body? Almost shocking and surprising to some of us that this would be a question, especially in the first century, but it was. So we have the Docetists who believe that Jesus did not have a real human body. Basilides, a first century Christian teacher and exegete in Alexandria, he had a son, but it's unclear whether he was a priest or not. This particular image shows him dressed as a priest, but the historical research seems unclear. He taught that Jesus only apparently had a body, he only appeared to have a body, and that Simon of Cyrene was the one who died on the cross. His teaching, his movement that followed him persisted for at least 200 years after his death, despite the fact that most of his followers blended in with the Gnostics in the second century. Marcion was the son of the Bishop of Pontus in present day Turkey. And he held that Jesus was the son of the heavenly father, but he understood that Jesus's body was only an imitation 
of a material body. He said that Jesus appeared without needing to be born or to grow into adulthood. He consequently denied Jesus's physical and bodily birth, death, and resurrection. He preached that Christians should be celibate and not marry. He also taught that there were two gods and his sect, his followers, that group lasted for th about 300 years. And then Apelles of Alexandria taught that Jesus had a real heavenly body that passed through Mary. He didn't take humanity from Mary. So Apelles was a second century disciple of Marcion who held that Jesus did possess true human flesh, but denied that he was born of human parents. He instead held that Jesus created a body of the stars and things as he descended to earth. And then he likewise let go of that matter as he ascended back to heaven. And rather than two gods, Apelles held that there was a supreme God and a fiery angel who attempted to rec replicate the heavenly creation, but failed to make them as perfectly. And then the Gnostics, which I mentioned before, they started in the first century and we're seeing them, their, their ideas very much resurface today. They believe that you find salvation within yourself. So no savior is needed. So therefore Jesus was just a bearer of, of, a, self, of a salvific message not the redeemer. We hear this idea a lot these days. So those are some of the major advocates of a position that Jesus did not have a, a real human body. On the other hand, those who proposed the idea that he did include St. John the Apostle. In, in his second letter, he says many deceivers have gone out into the world people who will not acknowledge the coming of jesus christ in the flesh that's part of the sacred scripture and then john goes on in various of his other writings and he mentions things that a human being does that jesus did including jesus rests he wept he ate and he drank and then of course he suffered moving forward just slightly in time. We have the Bishop St. Ignatius, who was Bishop of Antioch. And he taught that Jesus was truly born as the son of Mary, that he ate, he drank, he was persecuted, crucified, actually died and rose from the dead. And then Bishop St. Irenaeus of Lyon was also an advocate for this position. He wrote in his Adversus Heresies, which was written between 180 and 199, Quote, the church has received from the apostles and from their disciples the faith in one God, Father Almighty, and in one Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who became flesh for our salvation, born of a virgin. He also taught his bodily ascension into heaven. And then lastly, I'd like to mention Father Tertullian of Carthage, most commonly known as Tertullian. Um, Carthage is a port town in North Africa, not too far from Sicily. And in his work, De Carne Christi, so of the flesh of Christ. It was written between 208 and 211. He wrote, quote, to deny the reality of Christ's body is to deny the reality of the redemption, end quote. Jesus was made of a woman with flesh taken from the virgin. Lots of very strong, clear support for Jesus to be understood. He had an actual human body. Others continued to question and wondering if he had a human soul. So among them is Father Origen of Alexandria, second century into the third century. He was the son of a martyr. He's better known as just Origen. And he became an exegete and a teacher in order to support his six younger brothers after his father was martyred. He was a de deposed as a priest and a heretic later in his life. Um, he used the Logos Sarks approach to Christology. This is a, an approach that uh, Logos the word and Sarks the body that united them. And it really emphasized the unity of Christ. The word fulfilled in Jesus, the functions of the soul, or at least of the intellectual soul. That was Origen's position. And then we have Father Arius of Alexandria, who was also influenced by the Logos Sarks approach. And he's the founder of Arianism. Um, and Father Arius um, was trying to prove that the son was not equal to the father and so denied that Christ had a soul. 
In this way, he could avoid attributing to Christ's humanity certain things such as praying, wondering, and obeying, which are human things to do. By doing so, he reasoned that they would need to be done by the word, which was then understood to be inferior to the Father. He did hold that Jesus is the Son of God, begotten by God the Father. And lastly, I'd like to talk about Bishop Apollinarius the Younger, whose father was Apollinarius the Elder. He lived in Laodicea, Syria, and early in his ministry, he was highly respected and a friend with both St. Athanasius and St. Basil. As he opposed Father Arius's position, he overemphasized that Jesus was divine to the point that he denied that Jesus had a rational human soul. Various forms of his teaching continued through Eutychianism and Monophysitism for quite a long time. Father Arius, Father Arius's heretical teaching were condemned by the Council of Nicaea in 325. Bishop Apollinarius's teachings were condemned by the Council of Constantinople in 381. God, as his logos, assumed divine nature, including the noose, the body, and soul. Only as a full human being could he be humanity's perfect redeemer. And in 451, the Council of Chalcedon definitively defined that Jesus had a human body and a human rational soul. You would think this was everything, but there was another question that came up about Jesus' humanity. Was he fully part of the human race? Was he of the line of Adam and Eve? St. Luke in his gospel links Jesus to the entire human race, listing him as a descendant of Adam, Abraham, and David, a son of humanity, son of the covenant. St. Matthew in his gospel focused on Christ being descended from Abraham. The authors of the book, The Mystery of Jesus Christ, citing both St. Augustine and St. Thomas Aquinas put it this way, quote, Jesus solidarity in history with the human race reveals that divine justice shown in the redemption by arranging things so that atonement for sin would come from the sinful race itself. Moreover, it heightened the dignity of humanity because the evil one was conquered by a member of the race whom he defeated at the dawn of history. And God's omnipotence was revealed because from a weak stock and one wounded by sin, he formed the perfect humanity of Jesus and raised it to his dignity. St. Paul, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, in chapter 15, speaks of Jesus as the new Adam. Again, from the mystery of Jesus Christ, this time drawing from Pratt's work on the theology of St. Paul, it states, quote, this illuminating principle was not only perceived, but clearly formulated by the fathers of the church, all of them say in about the same words that Jesus had to become what we are in order to make us become what he is, that he became incarnate in order that deliverance should be accomplished by a man, that Christ as redeemer comprises and summarizes all humanity. Lastly, as we prepare to consider whether Jesus, son of Mary, was also God, I'll mention that the Council of Ephesus declared Mary to be the Theotokos, the bearer of God, in order to show the unity of the word of God with his human nature. Mary's motherhood is a cooperation in the redemption. She is the new Eve. So he was human, but was he divine? More questions to ponder. Understandably, this question was difficult. For a Jew daily praying the Shema, proclaiming that God is one, that idea that a man was God was blasphemous. Absolutely impossible, ridiculous, and unthinkable thought. Yet, he claimed he was. That is why at his trial, the priest tore his garments. Jesus of Nazareth was crucified precisely because he claimed to be God. Not a God, not any God, but the God. The Ebionites were a first century Jewish Christian sect. Remember, the followers of the way of Jesus were not kicked out of Judaism until after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. So this comes from the Hebrew word, Eboyanim, the poor ones. And they were called that because they viewed poverty as holy. And they reflect the Israelites' focus on one God, and they held that Jesus is the holiest human being. This also reflects the Jewish repugnance at the 
scandalous thought that God would die on a cross. Bishop Paul of Antioch was one of those who taught something called monarchianism. This idea emphasizes that God is one being, indivisible, one nature. So then Jesus is a man in whom the word dwelt, but the word is only the power of God, not God, God's self, the essence of God. So this opposes the idea of the Trinity for fear that that would devolve into a worship of three gods. There are two main variants of this line of thinking. The modalistic monarch monarchianism holds that God is one and works through different modes, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Monarchianism was considered a heresy after the fourth century. The other variant of monarchianism is called adoptionism. Theodotus of Byzantium was a writer in the late second century and taught this idea. Bishop Paul, a heresiarch, or Bishop Photinus, also held this role. Heresiarch means arch heretic. Adoptionists thought that Jesus came into existence at his conception and did not pre exist his conception as the Logos, which is something other people thought. Thanks to Jesus's holy life and acceptance of death, he then merited the glory of divinity. Therefore, Jesus was made God by adoption, not by nature. This teaching was condemned numerous times first by Pope St. Victor I in the late second century, then by a council in Antioch in 268 AD, the Council of Constantinople in 381 AD, and the Council of Rome in 382 AD. Stepping back into the late second century, Bishop St. Melito of Sardis was from a Jewish background and was highly esteemed in his day. He was involved in setting the canon of the Old Testament and in discussion about how to set the date for Easter. He was the Bishop of Sardis and declared that Christ is at once God and a perfect human being, that he had two essences while being one in the same person. He held that Jesus was both entirely human and entirely divine, that there were two natures in, in Christ. The heresiarch Father Arius, founder of Arianism, denied that the word was perfect God. For him, the word was a second rate God, as I mentioned, as a creature, the first and most perfect of the creatures, but not God. He taught that the son of God did not always exist, but was begotten within time by God. Therefore, he concluded Jesus was not co-eternal with the father. It came down to one letter. We'll talk about that in a minute. Bishop St. Athanasius of Alexandria was the 20th bishop of that see, serving in the fourth century. He was a deacon at the Council of Nicaea in 325. As a deacon at the council, he challenged Father Arius to produce even one piece of evidence from any early father of the church in support of this. Here we can see an example of what St. John Newman, Cardinal Newman, would later call the sixth sign of genuine development of doctrine, conservative action upon the doctrine's path. Authentic development of doctrine will retain what came before it, while corruption will reverse or remove what came before it. This was a contentious time with Arianism being adopted by many and persisting for several centuries. In fact, Bishop Athanasius was exiled, exiled from his see, kicked out of town five times. It came down to this. Homo usius or homoeus usius. So homoousius, with the O, literally means the same in being, same in essence. It can be translated consubstantial or co-essential. It's opposed to the idea of the Trinity for fear it would devolve into a worship of three gods. This word is first used by the Gnostics and it's used in the Nicene Creed, Jesus, one in being with the Father, as well as it's used to describe the Holy Spirit. Homoousius, literally similar in being or essence. This would be used to indicate that Jesus, son of God, was of a similar but not identical essence or substance with God. It supports the idea that God the Father is incomparable. It also would support the idea that Jesus was subordinate to God. This was marginalized by the Council of Constantinople. 
The Council of Nicaea was held in 325. Here, Arianism was condemned. The first council of Constantinople happened in 381. The Niceno Constantinopolitan sorry, Creed was adopted. This creed, thankfully, is commonly known as the Nicene Creed. That at this council, they also definitively finally declared the Trinitarian doctrine of the equal Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One God. We're not done. The debate continues. So Bishop Theodore of Mopsuestia was a monastic and a friend of St. John Chrysostom. He was in the forefront of the defense of the faith against Apollinarianism. At one point, he denied the title Theotokos to Mary and called her Anthropotokos instead because he kept his Jesus humanity and divinity is distinct. So Anthropotokos is, is bearer of the Anthropos, the human. Okay. Um, later, Bishop Theodore repented and came to hold the Theotokos position, bearer of God. Theodore expressed expressly wished to uphold the, the unity of person in Christ. In his view, the union of human and divine natures happens at will. The two natures form a unity akin to that of a husband and wife. While his positions were considered orthodox during his lifetime and he died at peace with the church, his teachings were denounced when they were cited by Nestorius and the Pelagians. This bishop who was praised at the Council of Chalcedon, Chalcedon sorry, was considered a heretic a century later. Patriarch Nestorius of Constantinople. So Patriarch of Constantinople, starting from 429. I bring up some of the background so that we can see that these are major figures. You know, we so often speak of Nestorius and Arian and, and Arius, and we just don't have any context, but realizing we have bishops and patriarchs involved, and we'll have a patriarch versus patriarch in it shortly. This was serious thrashing out of these ideas and trying to figure it out this because God's so beyond anything we can think. So the patriarch and Nestorius became a bishop in 429, the very year that Bishop Theodore died. Nestorius advocated the position that Mary was the Christotokos rather than the Theotokos. So the, the bearer of the Christ of the Messiah, not the bearer of God. So as you're hearing through this, you know, one of the Protestant things is that you guys are all into Mary and this definitions about Mary were really a clarification about who Jesus was. And it's very clear as we're looking through these debates and positions. So the Christotokos position married the human Christ who was special and united to the divine person of the word. Patriarch Nestorius taught that Jesus had two natures, therefore two subjects, each subsisted in itself and two physical persons a divine person and a human person in Christ. And they were so linked that in practice, it's as if there was only one person. So the human person was specially united by the union, by the united, specially united to the divine person of the word, by the union person. It was I'm trying to translate some of the Greek it gets crazy. Um, so this was something between a physical and a substantial union. Then we have Patriarch St. Cyril of Alexandria. He wrote Patriarch Nestorius several times opposing his positions. His third letter contained 12 anathemas in which the Nestorian propositions were condemned. Nestorius replied with his own 12 anathemas and accused Bishop Cyril of being an Apollinarian. The Council of Ephesus was called in 431 to deal with this very confusing debate, and very subtle differences in these positions. Patriarch Cyril of Alexandria presided. Here, Mary was declared to be the mother of God, the Theotokos, in order to solemnly affirm that Jesus was God. It also defined that there was one person in Christ and the word the Logos is defined. Patriarch Nestorius was deposed while Patriarch St. Cyril of Alexandria's position was adopted. The council approved St. Cyril's second letter to Nestorius, which I will quote quote from at length. Summary. I give you a summary here. The great and holy council said that the only begotten son was begotten by the fa God the Father according to nature, true God from true God, light 
from light, through whom the Father made all things. That he descended, he became flesh, he became human, he suffered, he rose on the third day and ascended into heaven. It is necessary that we should adhere to these words and teachings and consider what it is they mean. That the word of God became incarnate and became human. We do not say that the nature of the word, having changed, became flesh, nor that it became transformed into a complete or composite human of body and soul. Rather, we say that the word, having united itself according to the hypostasis to a flesh animated by a rational soul, became human in an ineffable and incomprehensible way and was called the Son of Man. This union is not due to the will alone or to pleasure, it did not happen by the assumption of a person, a prosopon, even though the two natures united by a true union are distinct. From them both there arises a single Christ and Son, not as if the union were to suppress the difference of the natures, but because the divinity and the humanity constitute for us a single Lord Christ and Son by their ineffable and mysterious coming together. They go on. Thus as it is said, that he subsists before all the ages, and that he was begotten by the Father, and that he was begotten by a woman according to the flesh, not that his divine nature started its existence in the Holy Virgin. Continuing, in this sense, we say that he suffered and rose again, not because the God word suffered in his own nature, the wounds, the holes made by nails, and the other wounds. The divinity is impassable because it is non-corporeal, corporeal, doesn't have a body, but rather given that the body which he had made his own suffered these wounds, it is said once again that he, the word, suffered for us, that which was impassable, impassable was in a passable body, okay? So God being in a human being could suffer because the human part could suffer because it had a body, where God not having material can't suffer because you can't nail something that doesn't have any matter. Okay. We have the same way of thinking regarding his death. The word of God is by nature immortal, incorruptible, living, vivifying. But in addition, he has his own body by the grace of God. He tasted death for the good of all, as St. Paul says in Hebrews. What is said is that he suffered death for the good of all of us. This does not mean that he experienced death in that which regards his own nature. It would be madness to say this or to think it, but that, as I have said a short while ago, his flesh tasted death. Thus we confess a single Christ, one single Lord, not adoring a man with the word so as to not to induce, introduce the idea of division by the use of the word with. Rather, we adore one single and same Christ, because the body of the word is not apart from him, and it is with it that he is now seated with the Father. There are not two sons seated with the Father, but only one on account of the union in his own flesh. Continuing to quote, all that is meant by saying that the word became flesh is the following. He participated like us in flesh and blood. Again, citing Hebrews. He made our body his own and came into the world as a man born of a woman. He did not abandon his divine being nor his generation from the Father God, but remained what he was while at the same time taking on flesh. Continuing. Here you have all that is taught by Orthodox faith everywhere. That is how we will find it in the teachings of the fathers. In this way, they, the fathers, did not hesitate to call the Holy Virgin Mother of God or Theotokos, not because the nature of the word or his divinity had taken from the Holy Virgin the principle of his existence, but because once the holy body animated by a rational soul to which the word was united according to the hypostasis was born of her, it is to be said that the word was begotten according to the flesh. Long coat quote came from the second letter to Nestorius from St. Cyril of Alexandria, written in 430, approved by the Council of Ephesus in 431, and reprinted in the Mystery of Jesus Christ. Nestorius was deposed as patriarch 
with the approval of Pope Celestine. So to summarize, here are the main points. Christ is one subject, hypostasis, only. He is one person, prosopia, prosopon, only. He who is God is also human through the union of a divine nature, physis, and a human nature. Mary, therefore, is truly the Theotokos. Mary gave birth according to the flesh, to the word of God made flesh. Christ is the son of God. It is wrong to say that Christ is a divinized man. It is wrong to say that Jesus is an adoptive son of God. Christ's flesh is life-giving, which is an implicit reference to the Eucharist because it, it is the flesh of the word. Christ should be worshiped with one adoration, not worshiped separately as God and as a human being. To the purpose, to the person of the word should be attributed not only the divine actions, but also the human actions and passions of Jesus. This, unfortunately, as clear as this is, some of the terminology St. Sterile used was still somewhat inexact. Exact. So the controversy continued after the Council of Ephesus. In 433, the formula of union was agreed on. It states, Jesus Christ is perfect God and perfect human, consubstantial with the Father in divinity and consubstantial with us in humanity. Given that the union was made of two natures, it is union without confusion. This statement prepared the way for the dogmatic formula at the Council of Chalcedon 18 years later. The expression hypostatic union is used to show that the union of the human nature and divine nature in Jesus Christ is a union of the hypostasis in the person, not in the natures. That is, the two natures are not mixed together, yet they belong to the same person. There are still many unresolved questions. Monophysitism held that there is one nature in Jesus Christ. Father Eutyches, and I couldn't find an image of him, was 70 years old in the year 448, and he had been an Archimandrite, an abbot of a monastery of 300 monks outside Constantinople for 30 years at that point. He was involved in many debates of the time and thought that Christ's human nature was absorbed by his divine nature and so was annihilated at the union. Okay, so he was thinking that when God became a human being, the human nature was absorbed. He was deposed, exculpated, and absolved, then ex exiled. His monophysite theses were condemned by the Patriarch Flavian of Constantinople in 448. Pope St. Leo I approved Patriarch Flavian's actions in a letter the following year, which reaffirmed the true doctrine concerning the hypostatic union, that in Christ there is only one person and two natures which are united while remaining distinct and unconfused with the character of both remaining distinct and not confused with the character of both natures unimpaired, therefore coming together in one person. Humility was assumed by majesty, weakness by strength, mortality by eternity. And in order to whip our guilt, the, I'm wondering if I have a typo, sorry. Um, the inviolable nature of, was joined to the nature subject Nope, sorry, let me go back. And in order to whip our guilt, the inviolable nature was joined to the nature subject to suffering, so that as our salvation demanded, one and the same mediator of God and humanity, the man Jesus Christ, could be could from one element be able to die and from the other not. The true God therefore was born in the complete and perfect human nature, complete in his nature and complete in ours. Others thought the two natures gave rise to a hybrid divine human nature, which was exclusive to Christ. Others were Apollinarianists who thought his divinity functioned as a spiritual soul of his body. Patriarch St. Cyril of Alexandria was the nephew of Patriarch Theophilus of Alexandria. He was a monk for some time and was consecrated Bishop of Alexandria in the year 412. Alexandria at that time was a highly contentious place with mob violence between factions, expulsion of the Jews of the city, and other unrest. In the winter of 427 to 428, Nestorius became Patriarch of Constantinople. Patriarch Cyril actively opposed Nestor Patriarch Nestorius's teachings, as I mentioned. 
St. Cyril summoned a council and composed a letter with propositions for, for Nestorius to anathematize. This was before the Council of Ephesus. Patriarch Nestorius refused to accept the message from his rival Patriarch. There was a great deal of back and forth. Patriarch Nestorius spoke of an unspeakably close junction between Christ's human and divine natures, but not a union in one hypostasis or person. Patriarch Cyril was a disciple of, of St. Athanasius and argues that the flesh of Christ is truly the flesh of God in that it is life-giving in the Holy Eucharist. Patriarch St. Cyril died in 444 after being bishop for nearly 32 years. While he worked valiantly to defend the Catholic doctrine, his language was not as precise as we needed, so was further developed by Pope St. Leo after the courageous but sometimes impulsive Patriarch St. Cyril's death. Unfortunately, a heresy based on his writings developed after his death. The Council of Chalcedon in 451 solemnly defined the hypostatic union, excluding Monophysitism, Arianism, Apollinarianism, and Nestorianism. This dogmatic definition not only asserted the distinction of the two natures of Christ, but also the direct consequence of that distinction. The hypostatic union was formed, quote, while preserving intact the property of both natures, end quote. We see, following, therefore, the Holy Fathers, we unanimous, unanimously say that the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, is one and the same. The perfect in divinity, the same perfect in humanity, true God and true human being, consisting of a rational soul and a body, consubstantial with the Father and divinity, consubstantial with us in humanity, in all things like as we are without sin, born of the Father before all time as to his divinity, born in recent times for us, and for our salvation from the Virgin Mary, the mother of God, as to his humanity. We confess one and the same Christ, the Son, the Lord, the only begotten, in two natures unconfused, unchangeable, undivided, and inseparable. The difference of natures will never be abolished by their being united, but rather the properties of each remain unimpaired, both coming together in one person, prosopon, and one substance, hypostasis not parted or divided among two persons, prosopa, but in one and the same only begotten Son, the divine word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as previously the prophets and Jesus Christ himself taught us and the creed of the fathers handed down to us. The above having been cons considered with all and every care and dil diligence, this holy ecumenical council has defined that no one may advance any other belief or inscribe, compose, hold, or teach it in any other way. Nonetheless, the debates continue. So let's summarize that. So we've got two intellects, divine and human, two wills, divine and human, perfect integrity of Jesus' human nature seen in his actions and his passions, physical and emotional. He doesn't have passions deriving from imperfection, no disordered passions, no emotions not perfectly controlled by reason, and no sin. Um, just a second. The debates continued. Monothelitism, the idea that Jesus only had a human nature without an effective human will, meaning that Christ would only have one will, was condemned at the Third Council of Constantinople in the seventh century. Lastly, these teachings are continually reinforced by the regular recitation of the Nicene Creed during the Mass and the Divine Liturgy, and by symbols used in the Eastern rites. During a blessing, a priest, bishop, or head of a monastery holds their fingers as on the left, denoting the be beginning letters of Jesus Christ in, in Greek, the I-C-X-C. When blessing oneself with the sign of the cross, all in the east, hold their fingers as on the right, with the first two fingers and the thumb held together to denote the three persons in the Holy Trinity, and the smallest fingers folded into the palm to denote the two natures in Jesus Christ, the divine and the human. So these teachings are expressed not only in conciliar decrees, but also in the lived practice and worship of the church. It's also seen by the icons of the Theotokos and the Trinity in Eastern Catholic churches. So thank you. As I mentioned at the beginning, I was citing many works and um, there's a list of them. They, uh, this was just the, the fastest of summaries of all of these different and complex teachings, some heretical, some not. And I'm hoping that you can see by giving a little context of who is who, 
the difficulty here, the level of people that were arguing and, and discussing and debating, as well as um, the complexity of the issues and the, the clarity that they had to come to and the, the particular Greek words and they were debating and having to redefine and clarify. And, and some of those words changed their meaning over time to give greater clarity to these ideas as they're wrestling with an ineffable idea of God becoming a human being and then two natures in one person and how all that works together and needing to protect and I very much appreciated the Jews at the beginning, um, even you know the Ebionites so forcefully, one God, one God. They, they knew what God had revealed to them and the whole thought of a human being being God and God being God, like we can't do that. Um, and so taking that time to really sort out some barest understanding, most simplified understanding of how in the world God could become incarnate, God could become a human being and walk around and teach and do miracles and be risen from the dead. Because it's, it's, it's an unthinkable thought that God would condescend to do that, but that is exactly what God did. So I want to thank you for your time. Um, and uh, forgive me if I misstated anything, I try to be very careful, do lots of quotations to get the conciliar language correct. Um, it's a very complex area, and hopefully this will get you started with having a, a context for the different people and their positions if you want to do further study in the area. So thank you, and God bless you.